May it please the Court, Dinah Stein on behalf of the appellants, Dr. Chazquez, Nurse St. Eloy, and Vora Health Services, uh, I would like to reserve one minute for rebuttal. Good morning, Ms. Stein. Thank you. Uh, and the appellants have raised three issues on appeal, and I'll start with the first one, which is the directed verdict issues. Uh, and it's our position that there was no expert who came into trial and said that the plaintiff's theory of damages, that, that the defendants prevented the wound that Ms. Jack has had, uh, that they prevented it from healing, uh, was more likely than not a cause of the defendant's alleged negligence. Are you saying that Dr. Stern, who got up and testified for quite a while, never stated what the standard of care was, and, or stated what the deviation was? Oh, he absolutely stated the standard of care. And that and was he, what? At which is, it was a bit of a moving target, but as <laughs> best as I could tell is that you either remove all of the infection, uh, and when he was questioned about the fact uh, that they should have, if they had done a deeper debridement, she would have bled out because she was on Coumadin, he said in that case you take her under this, on the steel and under the hot lights, you take her into surgery, uh, which would have required taking her off the Coumadin putting her at a stroke risk, but that was what he believed the standard of care was. And that absolutely was elicited. And, and we don't take issue with the fact that he did give so that testimony. let me be sure I understand this. The standard of care, you say the standard of care that was testified to by Dr. Stern was the proper way to do a debridement was not what was done at the nursing home. It was to take this lady to a hospital, correct? Correct. To reduce her anticoagulant, correct? Correct. To give her a heavier uh, anesthetic or sed sedation. <coughs> put her under. Sedation. Well, I'm not sure he said completely put her under. And to do a deeper um, cut, deeper debridement and wider debridement of this um, ulcer. That is the standard of care that you say he testified to? Like I said, it was he first testified it should have been done deeper this is both of the experts, deeper at the uh, nursing home, but when the risk of bleeding was raised, that is what Your Honor just said, what he said the alternative standard of care would be. And, and I just, maybe to get to the heart of this, we're not taking issue with that, um, even though we disagree, he did testify as to standard of care. Uh, what the problem was, was that the plaintiff's position, the damages they were seeking, uh, it was undisputed that she came to our defendants with a stage four ulcer. That, that is never an issue in this case. Uh, what they testified is that the three treatments in two weeks uh, permanently caused her not to be able to heal. And that is where we take issue. But do you take issue also with the fact that since she did not, the, the stage four ulcer did not occur there, it occurred elsewhere. That's the Fabre defendant that wasn't on the uh, on the verdict form, correct? That, that, that is our, our alternative argument, correct. Okay. Correct. But before we get to Fabre. Right. Uh, okay, so we have a standard of care. Right. Uh, that Dr. Stern testified to. Correct. And they didn't, they didn't comply with that standard of care. They did something in the nursing home. They didn't take her off the Coumadin, which meant if she'd have, they'd have cut deeper, she would have bled. So they didn't do that, obviously. They did something lesser. Taking the evidence in a light most favorable and to plaintiffs. And so, correct. and what is, the, what is the gooding but for? Well, the, the, the but for is causation, because the but for assumes that the standard of care testimony is correct and, and viable. Uh, in fact, it's quite rare that, it, that it's not, and we're not taking that position here. What the but for says is that within a reasonable degree of medical probability, the alleged breach in standard of care caused the damages asserted. That is our issue on appeal, and that is where we take issue with Dr. Stern's testimony, and I think it's so important to look at what he said and what he didn't say, because he said that the alleged are you, negligence... Are you saying he would have had to say that if you'd done it his way, if you'd done it his way, more likely than not, she would have had a better outcome? Correct. It would have changed the course of her recovery. Is that what he, according to you, would have had to have said? He can't just say that there's a breach and therefore that the plaintiff recovers. Are you That's, saying he never said that at any time? He did not say within the Gooding standard 
Uh, and I, I go back to his testimony because that's what we're taking issue with. He testified that by not following my standard of care, we allowed uh, infection, uh, and if you had followed my standard of care, she would have been on hopefully the road to recovery. He never said in his direct examination or anywhere within a reasonable degree of medical probability, my recommended care would have changed her outcome. And this is not a situation where the defense lawyer sat quietly and waited until the directed verdict motions and then said, aha, he didn't say magic words. He got up and cross and hit it right at the heart of it. And he said, tell me, do you say that your recommended course of treatment would have changed the patient's outcome? And he refused to commit. He said it would be a guess. He said, I would hope it would improve her recovery, but I can't say with certainty. And defense counsel said, I don't want to hear with certainty. We're not here talking about certainty. I want to know within a reasonable degree of medical probability, would your recommended course of treatment change Ms. Jacquez's outcome? And he said, I can't give that testimony. That's what we take issue with. Now yeah. tell us about Fabre. Uh, I, I, I do want to. There is a, a second defendant, and I, I don't want to be waiving the, the directed verdict issues as to her. Well, go uh, ahead and tell us about the directed verdict as to the nurse. I, I just want to make clear that there were two different experts. Uh, Dr. Stern was as to the, the doctor. Uh, nurse Black was, at, at, was, was as to Nurse uh, Alloy, St. Alloy. Uh, they were two separate. And there was a deal that only Dr. Stern went yes. to Dr. Chaskis and yes. Nurse Black. Yes. Went to Nurse Aloy. Yes. And in fact, um, at one point, that was, a, I believe, a pretrial ruling so that we wouldn't have a nurse testifying against a doctor and have experts uh, team up against uh, one defendant. Uh, at one point, when Dr. Stern was getting a little outside of, of Dr. Uh, Chaskas, there was an objection from the defense, and uh, the court instructed the jury to consider each expert separately. That what, was page. What was Nurse Black's um, testimony as to standard of care? What's your contention with that? It was similar. Uh, first, she would say that it should have been a deeper debridement. And, and when it was pointed out that she was on anticoagulants, she said, then you take her into surgery um, and, again, put her under, under the hot lights. And, and, but in that case, you do have to take her off the Coumadin, uh, which she was a stroke risk, but she said it's, it's, it's worth it to clean the wound. And that was her, her standard of care testimony. Uh, but she, again, she, she was a little more convicted than Dr. Stern, but again, missing from her testimony, and I can't find it anywhere, is where she said, uh, because she didn't say, that had her recommended course of treatment been taken, more likely than not, within a reasonable degree of medical probability, her entire course of treatment would have changed. And again, in cross-examination, defense counsel took issue with this, and I want to point out, because you really have to look at what they're saying, not just magic words uh, thrown in, uh, but he, he, defense counsel tells the nurse, uh, now it didn't heal. It went on from that point forward, and the testimony is it never healed, even after the next six months when the wound team was not anywhere in sight. They weren't around. And she says, page 469, so the damage was so great that it was unhealable at that point. And then she says, I don't know why it didn't heal. It should have healed. Well, their whole their whole theory of damages was that we caused a wound to not be able to heal, and they got $340,000 uh, for that. So again, she is admitting that it should have healed with proper treatment after our experts. Now, Your Honor, um, unless you have questions about that, I'll move on to the Fabre issue since you asked. Um, and, and it's our position alternatively that at the very least, uh, we should have been able to place Memorial West, the, the original treater, on the verdict form. Are, are you claiming that Linkhouse is no longer necessarily good law uh, now that now that we're into you know things have changed since I think 1981, which was the Linkhouse decision, and with regard to um, the negligence and how uh, defendants uh, share responsibility. In negligence, are you saying that's no longer good no. law? No. Are you just saying? No, no, we're saying that is good law. Okay. Uh, and in fact, Linghouse, um, it was a 1983 decision. It was approved by the Supreme Court based on it properly using the Gooding standard. If, if you look to where it was approved, so that is the law. 
And, and it's our position uh, that that I mean, we're, we're, we're back we're back on the no. I guess the directed verdict issues. No, I'm sorry. Then I, I skip back. So okay. now tell us about Fabre. I okay. thought uh, and, and, and maybe okay. And I think I know what your honor is asking. And let me get to that. I, I we did take a position that Demario has been overruled. Uh, I don't think we need to get that far under these facts, and, and I'll start with that because I think under the existing law, uh, this is just a straight out joint and several situation where Fabre applies because under all of the case law that we've cited pre DeMario, after DeMario now, this is a continuing injury. And the injury that happened at the hospital and which continued with our um, that the, the nursing home was the same continuum of the same injury. And the case law has, has been pretty clear that where you have one injury that multiple defendants failed to, you know, either did or failed to treat, that's joint and several. And, and I think the most um, pertinent cases that we've cited are the Jackson versus York Hanover Nursing Center's case from the Fifth District, uh, which of course was followed in this court's decision in stay right uh, which, again, looked to the nature of the injury and, and what's being contended that each defendant did. Uh, in, in the Jackson case, it was a continuing course of dehydration. Uh, in the stay right course, it was the continuing course of keeping the plaintiff underwater. And Ms. Fine, could yes, you can, Your Honor. Can we talk about the Fabre issue because I'm interested in that issue. You, your purpose was uh, you wanted Memorial West on the verdict form, which was the initial place where she developed the stage four ulcer, correct? Correct, Your Honor. All right. And then is there a reason why you didn't request uh, Jackson or Aventura Hospital also, or you just did Memorial West? Memorial West, uh, I, I don't know the reason except for the fact that it, it was undisputed that that's where it occurred and that that's where it was not treated and went from a stage one to a stage two to a stage three to a stage four as our defendants found her. And, and also, um, the, the, the testimony was, uh, did apply to, there was testimony that Memorial West was negligent. I, I don't recall what it was as to Aventura, uh, but in fact, when the parties were discussing the verdict form, uh, Ms. Lagos, one of the attorneys for the defendant, when they were talking about the comparative, said we were waiting to see what the evidence was before we asked for a particular verdict form. So it did play out that way. Uh, and in fact, uh, Nurse St. Eloy and Dr. Ginsink, the, the defendant's expert, uh, did give testimony, uh, some of it quite extensive, that Memorial West uh, was negligent in allowing this to occur. Because it, it's undisputed that when she was transferred from Memorial West to the nursing home, she already had the stage four ulcer. That's undisputed. And I think there was, there, there was a pretrial, there was a partial motion for summary judgment where the defendant said, look, this is undisputed. And I, that was granted. So yeah, that was, that, that, that was undisputed. Well, it, it, in looking at the record here, this lady went to Jackson Memorial North twice during her hospitalization, during her stay at the uh, nursing home. Mm -hmm. And then she was discharged to a third hospital. She went to Aventura. And then she went home for a very long time. Now, I see that the daughter was fabrayed on. But I don't see, and um, I actually read the entire medical record, I do not see that any treatment other than the treatment that was prescribed by Dr. Chaskis at the nursing home was anything different was ever given to this lady at all by any other hospital in any other manner. And this supposedly um, to, to treat this, and I don't see that any of those people were joined either at, as Fabre, which makes me curious. As well, well, okay, okay. And the reason she was taken to uh, Jackson was she had Coumadin toxicity. It, she was being exactly. loaded up with Coumadin. Well, maybe exactly. she had to go or didn't have to go. They'd take her, they'd give her some fresh frozen plasma and vitamin K, and they'd ship her back. This lady had lots, lots of problems. Right. Lots and lots and lots and lots of problems. Was, did, did Mr., I mean, Dr. Stern or Nurse Black ever testify, or, or was it asked, I just don't recall, at, um, during cross or direct, that when uh, Ms. Chaquez was at Memorial West, which is where she developed the stage four ulcer, and she, since that was 
a hospital and their standard of care is at a hospital you should, you know, do a deep cleaning or if not put her in the surgery. How about you should prevent it? You know, well, yes, that's true, but uh, did was that asked? Was shouldn't they have done that there prior to transferring her to the nursing home? Uh, right, and and I do believe that that Nurse Black was asked about that by defense counsel, and she wouldn't take a position. I mean, uh-huh. she just she said I she wasn't wouldn't. asked about the hospital. She, she was asked. I don't recall specifically Dr. Stern, uh, but but Nurse Black wouldn't wouldn't say. She said I I wasn't asked to read their records. I was only given the records of this care and treatment, so I don't know. And that was part of it. They weren't told by their counsel to read those records, so they wouldn't testify. Uh, Dr. Ginseg, on the other hand, said, anytime this happens, you know, come on, you've got to be treating this in a hospital. You can't just treat the hip injury. You've got to treat the bed sore. Don't those have to be reported to the Department of Children and Families, a bed sore? Uh, that, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what happened at the hospital level as far as reporting. Uh, there were some issues. I mean, there, there, there was the nursing home was on the verdict form as well for not following orders of um, the, the doctors. And there were issues as to whether or not that should have been reported. Uh, and I believe that the defendants took the position that they weren't aware of noncompliance. Uh, what, but was, that, what was Judge Thomas's, uh, what was the basis of his ruling for denying or uh, eliminating uh, Memorial West from the verdict form since the, uh, the daughter was on the verdict form and clearly she was after the fact Right. After the, uh, the the only person not on the verdict form who actually caused it is not on the verdict form. And so what is the basis for it? The basis was the Whitehead decision. And, and the, the plaintiff brought this to the attention of the court after directed verdict motions, which of course we say is untimely anyway, after the charge conference and said, well, wait, there's, there's this decision that says that where the plaintiff caused his own need for medical care, uh, in that case it was an overdose, uh, you don't put that person on the verdict form if you're accusing the uh, subsequent medical providers of doing something differently. Counsel, you, you confused me. I asked okay. you about Linkhouse, and that's Whitehead oh, versus Linkhouse. I am Linkhouse. sorry, Your Honor, then I, I was looking at the wrong case. And Okay, let me answer Your Honor's question. You are <laughs> correct. These cases I'm all blend together. Thinking, wait a minute. Um, we're contending that whether we don't think it applies, but again, it's the same answer. We don't think we need to get there in this case because this is such a clear situation of joint and several. Well, my question is, is it really applicable any longer because the, the law was different in those days Correct. than it is now. So really, is that, is that case still good law and I, I, I even don't, though it may or may not apply to right. this case? I, I don't think it is. I think there's a very compelling argument that it's not. Um, that And that was... One of the bases for DeMario, that the Supreme Court was looking at that case in Stewart versus Hertz, but now, of course, DeMario is no longer good law. Uh, I don't think we need that case when we have joint and several. And I don't think it, I, I submit that it does not apply here anyway, because we didn't have the same continuum of, of an injury there. Uh, we had somebody who, who overdosed and created his need for medical care, but the injury that the, the medical providers caused was death. Whereas here we have the same injury. We have the bed sore, it starts as a bed sore, it continues as a bed sore, and it went on and on as a bed sore uh, at stage four. Counsel, so, we've, we've let you go way over your time. Okay, but I we appreciate will, that. But we will give you extra time for rebuttal. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Dine. We'll give opposing counsel a little extra, because he's about to jump out of his skin. Thank you. Good morning. Good Bart morning. Rockenbach on behalf of um, the plaintiff, and I can assure you that even without a microphone, you will have no problem hearing me. I could probably do the oral argument from West Palm Beach, and you'd still hear me. Say thank you for coming from, to West, from West Palm Beach. <laughs> yes. Um, wow. Um, Tell us about proximate cause. Let's let's start about that there. Excuse me. Let's start with causation. Let's causation. All right. Um, they're actually the same issue, and uh, they're, they're, they they have their root in the same place. The the, the first issue here on the causation instru- uh, the uh, causation testimony not being sufficient, and then the Fabre issue. And the root of it is that the plaintiff's case, the, the, the claim that the plaintiff made, had nothing to do with the cause of the initial um, uh, bed sore. What is, what is, okay, let's back up. What is the standard of care that was, that was going to apply here, that well, you're expert? I mean, what is it that, that uh, the standard that 
was not properly utilized in this case? What do you say it was? The, the standard of care was, as Ms. Stein described, was that uh, our, uh, our experts testified and the jury apparently accepted that the um, uh, that Ms. Uh, Nurse St. Aloy and Dr. Chaskas should have done a more intensive debridement that any time they leave, they, they left necrotic tissue, dead tissue, on top of the... Uh, to do it, they had to take her to the hospital, correct? Well, that's take one her, option. Take her, off, take her off Coumadin because she was really on Coumadin and she would have bled. So mm -hmm. I think both your experts testified, yeah, we had to back down that Coumadin before we could do a deeper debridement and give a heavier uh, sedation or anesthetic. I think they both testified to that. Well, their testimony was that you, there's really an option. There is certainly the heavier anesthetic. That was, the, that was necessary. It had to be at least a local so that the person, it, they said it was inhumane to try to do a, a debridement, a proper debridement with just a topical anesthetic because that would never get down to the living tissue and it would never do anything to numb the pain. So there had to be at least a local anesthetic. Now, um, the, uh, they, they also testified that they could try the debridement without taking her off Coumadin and then see if the bleeding becomes too intense. And if it did, then they'd have to do the procedure in a hospital setting, take her off of Coumadin so that she is there. If there is a problem, it can be taken care of quickly in an emergency room setting. Um, but go to the hospital and have the debridement done to get rid of all the necrotic tissue. You would have to that sounds go to like, the hospital. No sounds like, gee what. whiz, you know, you tried it one way. I would have tried it another way. Uh, what is the standard of care? Is the standard of care that, that what they started with was not good enough and continued? Or is, is there, your obligation is to say, they did this and it deviated from the standard of care because this is what should have been done. So what is the this that your expert said should have been done, the standard of care from which the other side deviated? remove the necrotic tissue because by leaving the necrotic tissue there they allowed an infection to be created well that's the result but you know something needed to be done yes remove the, the necrotic tissue the methodology tissue. that they used was wrong yes so the it, it, it's very simple it's that they did not remove the necrotic tissue the necrotic tissue was there it was harboring bacteria and they did not do the necessary debridement to remove the dead but, tissue. But in order to remove the, all, the entire necrotic tissue, okay, because they did remove some of it, but some was left behind, correct? Uh, they removed some of it, yes, yes, and some was left behind. Right. And so your expert, whether it's a doctor, Dr. Stern, or Nurse Black, their testimony is that in order to uh, fully cure her of the stage four ulcer, it had to be an, an intense debridement, which really meant taking her to the hospital because what I'm hearing is, uh, you know, you have to take her off the Coumadin or you leave her on the Coumadin, but if she starts bleeding, you mean you're not going to do that in the nursing home. I mean, if not, then she'll bleed out. You need to really do that in the hospital in order there, in, in, in case there's excessive bleeding, correct? Yes, that's, that's the safest place to do it. Right. Would be in the hospital. So the standard of care was, from my reading of, of especially Dr. Stern was, you need to take her to the hospital and, and decrease her, get her off his curcumidin, put her in a place where you could have given her, and he even at one point said anesthesia. I'm not sure what he meant by that, but more than just a local, and give a really deep debridement so as to, that was his standard of care. And by not doing that, they departed from the standard of care, which resulted in the infection. Now, the, I want to point out that the jury accepted our standard of care, and the appellant has not appealed this case on the standard of care. Standard of care is something that it has been not agreed to, but it has been acquiesced that the jury. The real question is: had he, your, your physician says, "Okay, uh, and if they had done that, you know, um, okay, she got an infection, or maybe whatever, but and and." What was, and are you saying, what, what's your end result? Are okay. you saying that she would have been cured and said, oh, no, no, I'm never going to say you be cured. I'm not, not going to do that because I can't guarantee you're ever going to cure a bed sore. Um, but I think it, it, it would have given her a better chance to get better because this isn't a question about no cure. This is a question about she had pain from this thing until she died because she died of something else. 
right? Yes. Cure was never a question. Right. That wasn't an issue. The plaintiff never alleged that it should have been cured. <clears throat> but your expert was asked, and I guess this is the tricky part, I mean, if you had, if, we, if, if they had gone with the care that your expert recommended or indicated, would the result have been any different? And doesn't your expert have to testify it w would have been more probable than not that the result would have been different? I, I, I think he's got to testify to that. Now, and, Judge, what he testified to was they caused an infection. Okay. That's what they, that's what they testified. That is sufficient. The other standard where it would have been different is, well, obviously, if they caused an infection by doing this, then it would have been different if they hadn't done it. But, 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 but that's not cause, the... how did they cause the infection when, By leap... I'm sorry. When, I said, how did they cause the infection? That's where I'm having... I'll ask you to do the Fabry defendant in a second. That's where I'm having the issue because how did they cause the infection when she already came to the nursing home with the stage four ulcer from Memorial West? The stage four ulcer was not infected when she came there. When she got there, it was a clean stage four ulcer. Just having a stage four ulcer well, he, does not he mean that it's say, He doesn't say in his testimony that she wouldn't have gotten, that it, it wouldn't have gotten. He would just, the whole issue that he testifies to is, over, over, because that's the problem with this whole, oh, it wouldn't have gotten infected. Well, maybe it got infected. It was fine when she left the nursing home the first time and went to the hospital. Okay? And she went to, to Jackson. She went to the hospital. She was there for two days. She went to the hospital. She came back. Then something else happened. She went to another hospital. Then some infection was noted. Well, after that, she went to two other hospitals. And, and the issue is not that this infection just went downhill or that it was a horrible infection they couldn't cure. As a matter of fact, there's no testimony in any of this that anything else happened from there until the day this lady died. His testimony had to be been, if you'd have done what I'd have said, not only would she not have gotten infected, but boy, this lady would have gotten better. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't judge, say any of that. Well, judge, you have, to, you have to remember that the plaintiff's case was not, was, was not that you failed to cure the, the, um, the ulcer. The plaintiff's case was that you caused an infection, and our experts testified that they caused an infection. Well, we then, satisfied well, the then your testimony would have had to been, I think, okay, what damage, what damage was caused as a consequence? Is that, that infection ever cured anywhere down the line? Would anything happen from the minute you left that hospital? You caused an infection, but his testimony was, we're trying to, my testimony is, if you'd done it my way, she would have had a better chance of it getting better over the next 10 months of this woman's life, not just for a day or a minute or a week. I mean, uh, I, I mean, it was very clever to cut this in little piece, little chunks like this, very clever. But the problem is <clears throat> you got damages for the rest of this woman's life, for the pain and suffering, not from just an infection she had on three days, but from the fact that she, she had a bed sore for the rest of her life that hurt her. You know, an infected bed sore. If she had just had a bed sore, we would have gotten zero damages because we never asked the jury to award damages for a bed sore. We asked the, damage, we asked the jury to award damages only for the infection. If she had come to, their, come to Miami Gardens with a stage four uh, ulcer, and if, they, if Chaskis and St. Eloy had prevented an infection and done anything other than make it worse, you know, our case is that they made it worse. And so when they got, if, if she had gone through, had a stage four ulcer, and then died with a stage four ulcer, we get zero in damages because there was no cause of any problem. There was, we wouldn't be able to bring that case, but because our, our case was no, that there was an I, aggravation. I, I read the entire transcript. I read the entire record in this case. I read every medical, every, all those medical things. Are every, you the one that requested the medical every records? Every single <laughs> thing. I don't answer questions. I ask them. <laughs> I'm just okay? kidding. And I've read every single piece of all of those documents, and I don't see a shred of anything in any, any of that medical record from any physician, and boy, there were a ton of them for everything you could name for this woman, okay, that talked about a problem with an infection in this bed sore, ever. And nor was there a change in the protocol for treating this bed sore in the months until she left in July, to go to go back. No, she left to go to Dominican Republican in July. Okay, then she was in the hospital at Aventura and everywhere. And there's home nursing care. Not one change in the medication or anything given to this lady, ever. 
or mention of that in those medical records. I didn't realize this case was about an infection. I thought this case was about not treating the person so that over time this bed sore, which couldn't be cured, would get better. That's, I, that's well, that, why I read your whole, well, I, I missed the whole point of this. Yeah, the, the testimony in this case was never about curing. Never a, about curing. Never. It was about getting better. It, no, it was never about getting better. It was about the damage, the aggravation of a pre-existing condition, so to speak. It's a Stewart versus Hertz case. It is a, you know, she came with a stage four ulcer and Chaskis and St. Eloy made it worse. And that's what this case was about. So the, the uh, now the medication did change in the hospitals afterwards. Um, uh, you, uh, it, it went from the- Accuzyme to Santal. She took Bactrim. They, mostly what happened was they cleaned this thing with sterile, normal ster sterile saline and put four by fours on it. And that's pretty much what happened twice a day and kept it clean because she was incontinent and you know and she had a lot of pro she had a lot of other problems that she went to different hospitals for but i don't see that that there was any you know she was on the hospital a lot any big time treatment for this anywhere else it was uh, an infection judge, it was an infection that's with now, what she had wow that's awesome the, the 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 evidence that you're bringing up is something that would have been argued at trial with the question of where was the causation? Because they had they had an argument that we didn't cause it; it was caused by the subsequent uh, subsequent hospitals, Aventura or Jackson North. And uh, the only reason that the Fabre this gets into the Fabre issue, the only reason Memorial Garden no right, Memorial West. West was not a Fabre was because they were a preceding cause. And so the judge, he didn't look at Whitehead versus Linkus and say, oh, that's, this is why I'm doing it. He said when he was informed that, uh, the, uh, that Memorial West was the cause of the initial ulcer, that's when Judge Thomas reversed himself and said, okay, that, that, they aren't going to be a Fabre defendant now. Uh, because if you look at the te the, his statement from the day before, he said that because Memorial West might have aggravated it, then they would have to be a Fabre. But now what you're talking about, Judge, is all the evidence of medical records and that the fact that the, uh, uh, if the medicine wasn't changed, and, and I can't read doctor's handwriting very well. I tried last night, and, and I got some of it, but I saw that the medication did change, and, but that's why they have experts. That's why they have an expert to come in and testify, well, if we did something that was so wrong on the standard of care, then it would have been done differently later on down the pipe. But it wasn't done, so therefore we must have been right. Now that's a standard of care issue, and they would have raised it, would have challenged it, they didn't challenge it, and are not challenging it on appeal. So the question of whether the medication was changed later on is something that is not part of this appeal. The question here is, is whether... Your damages were for pain. <clears throat> Most of your damages were for pain. Yes, and pain, and, and inconvenience of having an infection. <clears throat> right. For pain and suffering from this bed sore that continued on uh, un until she died. She had this bed sore. Correct? Correct. It, w it was for that. It was for, for, for that pain, and that's most of what it was. Yes. Correct. I just wanted to be sure that, that I knew right. that that was because I didn't, again, you're right, some of the doctor's notes are not legible, but then a lot of the nurses, there were a ton of nurse's notes that were really le legible including, you know, grading the pain from this bed sore every single day. Every single day for months and months and months, they graded the size, the odor, the, the, the discharge, the color of the discharge, um, and the pain, the amount of pain that the, uh, this individual was suffering. Well, the problem with reading doctor's notes and nurse's notes in hospital records, hopefully that goes away as we become more computerized, but that's one of the reasons we rely on people to come into a court and testify what is in those medical records. So the... So if, if those medical records all show never a day but one day with moderate pain of any kind, then we sh and that's in the record, we should just, it should be disregarded. Um, because the jury knew that she suffered pain because the daughter said so. Well, in it, assuming and that... And that's a weighing of an evidence thing, and the jury is entitled to do the that. Jury would have, the jury had the records and had the testimony and weighed it. Uh, Judge Logue, you have something to ask me. Counsel, I do have. I mean, and I'm, I'm kind of 
focused on this one point. Your, the opposing counsel seems to put a lot of weight on this issue of um, when your expert testified, he said, look, I, there should have been a different procedure than the one that was done. And, and you should have done procedure, instead of doing procedure A, you should have done procedure B. That's what your, your expert testified to. Procedure A was below the standard of care. I think he was pretty strong on that. Yes. Um, but then regarding procedure B, he was asked, look, if, if procedure B had been done, uh, and I'm just going to, uh, you know, do you know whether or not her sacral ulcer would have progressed differently or caused her any less pain in the long run? And your expert answers, in the long run, you're right. The answer is no. That would be difficult to assess, and I'll stand by that. Mm -hmm. Now, is that testimony fatal to your case? I mean, it, it, doesn't that create a, a, a causation issue for your case? Uh, Judge, I would say that that testimony is irrelevant to this case because the, the question was, first of, all, it's a, first of all, it's a compound question. It says, uh, was there any uh, change, would there be any change in progress or pain? in the long run, and what he said was, no, I can't assess that. In the long run, I can't assess that. I don't know. Doctors don't come into court to testify about what people's pain levels will be. They allow, because that's not their, their question is whether you drop below the standard of care and whether there was, what medical injury was caused as a result of the failure to comply with the standard of care. The issue of pain is something okay, but, that. But this issue of, uh, you, you dropped the low, below the medical standard of care because you did A and you should have done B. Mm -hmm. And then it seems, and maybe I'm stuck on this, so you're helping me. I mean, it seems to me then, okay, then if we had done B, the result would have been different? Well, I don't know. Well, his other testimony. Which, which means that's a, that's a pretty. It's a pretty hard uh, situation we're putting the doctors in. Whatever you, if someone else thinks you could have done something differently, then you're liable, whether or not that would have made a difference. Because it's a compound question, we don't know what part of the question he was answering to. Yes, uh, because you know, is it progression or pain? And I would take it as he's talking about pain. But progression, to the extent that there's any defect in his testimony as to progression, then Dr. Black took care of that problem by testifying that this would have healed if the proper treatment had been performed. Well, he testifies, healed, you can't say this would have been cured. You're Dr. Stern, and Dr. Stern goes to Dr. Chaskis. He says, oh, no, I can't say this would be cured. I, I, and he says that multiple times. I can't say this would be with 100 percent certainty. But the whole the whole point of this was, you didn't make it better. It didn't get better, and and and, it, and or it, your claim now is you made it worse. And because of that she was in pain because it didn't cause her death. What she suffered from was, she was in pain then for the rest of her life. And basically, that's what the question that was asked for him here is. Are you telling me that if we done it, if they'd done it your way, it would have, it would have had a better outcome from her, and so she wouldn't have had the pain that you're collecting the money for? And he said, you know, it's difficult to assess, and I can't say that. That this, these answers to these questions, I have to tell you, are the ones that are, are really where the rub is here. No, well, Judge, the the question, you know, the plaintiff's case was not the questions that those were, that were being asked at that point. The defense counsel. Unfortunately, you have cross examination. No, I, I, cross, I understand. <laughs> but what, what defense counsel did was to spread the case out. The plaintiff brought a case in for aggravation, and our experts testified that these, these two doc, this doctor and nurse aggravated it. Defense counsel on cross examination said, ah, but now let's spread it out to cure. But you your complaint alleges that they let it happen, that they were the cause of it, and that they let it deteriorate. That's what the allegations of the complaint were, because I've looked at that several times to try to see exactly what it was, and it says that, I can't remember the exact wordiology, but you, this, these people allowed it to occur, which we know did not happen. This uh, prior hospital let this occur and let it get to a stage four all, all before it landed in, in Dr. Chesky's and nurse, this nurse's lap. So now the question is, the claim, the allegation was deteriorate. Well, you know, you, you, you probably recognize that at some point um, the pleadings and the complaint, the allegations and complaint, and what comes out of trial are very often different, and that's why it is so freely, you know, amendments are so freely given at trial to conform to the evidence. 
uh, because that does happen here. But, but the problem in this case is putting your finger on, and it's a med mal case, and, and there's a standard that has to be met. And, and the standard is, you, here's the standard that has to be met, and you didn't do it, and this person was injured. And that's not necessarily a moving target. I mean, the target is, what is it that this physician should have done or these people should have done that is the standard, that they deviated from that standard that caused this? And I'm not sure that's a moving target. I mean, I think by the time you get to trial, you should know specifically what well, that is. It wasn't a moving target in this trial. Our experts testified what the standard of care was and said that unequivocally that as a result of you breaching the standard of care, Dr. Chaskis and, and Nurse St. Aloy, you caused an infection. And tell me, just say one more time what the standard of care was. The me. standard of care was that they should have removed all the necrotic tissue. That might require going to the hospital and, uh, to remove the Coumadin and then uh, do it in a surgical bay and have the, uh, the hospital emergency staff there in case there was excessive bleeding. Uh, but that was the standard of care, that you should have removed all the necrotic tissue. Leaving necrotic tissue hurt but, her. Okay, so here, which brings me to the question I think we've been talking about. Um, that's a that's a, a lofty goal, but I'm not sure that's a standard of care. I think he wa had to waffle some, because the standard of care for perhaps a person like me, a healthy person with a bed sore, and one who who you have to take the patient as you find them. He was a lady on a lot of Coumadin with a lot of other problems. I think he, they waffled a little. There might, there might have been a different standard of care. If the patient was different, the standard of care might have, would definitely have been different. That, that's and, I, and I think when we focus on this, this uh, individual, um, the question is what was the standard of care for this? And I think that was, you probably have to take her, do something about her anticoagulant. Take her to the hospital where we could address her anticoagulant and then address uh, a deeper level of anesthesia on a, in this age, this woman an 88-year-old woman. Those yes. were the conditions on, that related to this, in addition to she had a whole bunch of other problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, but again, the, the appellant has not appealed the standard of care finding by the jury. So that's well, not an issue. We have to start with what the standard of care is to see then. Uh, I mean, I have to start there. I had to put my finger on the standard of care first. All right. But, but, the, but the causation, what was caused from here was never an issue. And it was the infection and the aggravation of the stage four ulcer that was caused. And if the jury had found that there was no change to that stage four ulcer, it never got infected, then we would have lost, according to our own testimony. What, def what the defendant did here was to spread it out to a question of cure and healing, and that's not our issue. We, you know, the question of healing the, 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 uh, the ulcer was not something that the plaintiff raised because that's not what our claim is. Our claim was never that they should have healed her in the, thir the 21 days that they provided treatment. Our claim is that in the 21 days you should not have created an infection that was so bad that it could never be cured. And if they had some evidence, if the defendants had some evidence that it could have been and cured there later. there was testimony that... that they, the infection was so bad that it could never be cured because they failed to abide by that it could never be cured. Well, that not they, that it, it that never was an cured. That they, that an infection it set in that was that set in bad or not bad. An infection set in that could and was never cured to the end of this woman's life. Do, uh, Dr. Black testified that it could have been healed, but did not heal because of the infection. And, and both of them, Stern and, and Black, both testified, I think, that um, an infected wound can never heal. It will not heal while it's infected. You have to get rid of the infection. And Dr. Black talked about ripping the, the roof off of the, the place where the Which bacteria is living. Which brings us to the other doctors and hospitals, because once this woman had the infection, someone should have been addressing that infection. Can, you know, in other words, just because you have an infection doesn't mean it can never be cured. We all get infections all the time. They're cured all the time. Mm -hmm. Or every time every one of us cut a finger and it got infected, you die. So infections can be cured. So in other words, we come to, to, to my next to the next part. There's no testimony, I mean, about anyone addressing 
this infection or having a problem with this infection or saying this and that this was something that that couldn't be uh, the infection couldn't be made better. The fact that the bed sore itself didn't cure, get, go away, is a different issue. Not all infections can be cured. No, this, not this all. Is, we end up, it, some of us die right. of them. This infection, they testified that it had started tunneling, meaning that the, the bacteria, as Dr. Black said, it was, it was looking for food. So it was going down into the body deeper and, and that's deeper. That's what infections do. And, he, and what she said was that at some point, it's, it's too far gone and you can't stop it. Now, her testimony was that Chaskis and St. Eloy caused the infection. And then, also, they did not treat it properly afterwards, didn't, change, didn't swab it for bacteria culture to find out what the bacteria was, so they, could, they would know what antibiotics to use. So, and the then, so that testimony was, once that got in there, once that got going, you could never cure, you could never cure that infection. That infection was going to keep going until it ultimately, if her upper GI bleed had not gotten her, that would have been her demise. It would have been the end because she had that infection and once she had it in there, it was just going to keep going and there was nothing going to stop it and it was going to kill this woman. No, they did not go that far. They didn't testify about it never being healed. It could never be healed. The, the fact is it never did heal. Uh, and the defendant, if, if the defendant had some evidence that going down to the Dominican Republic somehow made it so that it got worse or somehow contributed to the damages, then they would bring that evidence and, and prove that it wasn't their fault. And if a jury believed the, the evidence brought by the defendant that any one of these subsequent people or hospitals caused the, the, um, uh, the infection to not be healed, then the jury was free to say that this defendant or these defendants did not cause all the damages or reduce the damages down to $5,000, $10,000, whatever it is, just deciding that although they caused the infection, it should have been cured by subsequent treatment and, and other physicians. And if it was, then the damages caused by allowing the infection to get embedded to begin with would have only been ca uh, caused damages for a very short period of time. But they didn't do that. There was no evidence to that, to that and the jury was really not free to speculate. Thank you, counsel. We've let you go over Thank, Thank you. Counsel, we'll give you another minute. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and Judge Wells, you understood the plaintiff's theory of the case perfectly. Uh, they were contending, they sought money for, and they got money for an alleged uh, failure to cure a wound and causing it to be permanent damage. And that was their burden, and that is what they did not put on. Uh, and in response to Your Honor's pointing out uh, Dr. Stern's testimony, and, and of course you suggested it was adverse uh, to the plaintiff when he said, I can't tell you whether this made a difference. No, if I can, counsel, I mean, but that being said, Dr. Stern did testify based upon a reasonable medical probability that the failure to do the debridement caused the infection. Correct. So the jury could have found that there was a, uh, you know, treatment below the standard of care which caused the infection. Correct. And as... Doesn't, doesn't that get them home? No. No. Uh, because what, what counsel wants the court to believe is that I mean, the jury... Words, isn't that enough? I mean, rather than saying if you did something else, it would have stop prevented the infection well I mean, your, your argument is well but they're saying we should have done b and but frankly they can't say b would have led to a different result but but i guess what he's saying is hey we know a what didn't someone testified there was competent testimony that <clears throat> failing to do the debridement caused the infection whether or not that's existentially true i don't know but but if there's competent testimony the jury could find that so so I guess, do we need to know whether there's another treatment that would have stopped the infection? Absolutely. And, and, and to answer that, first of all, as Judge Wells points out, infections can be cured. So, so the next question is, uh, can a jury infer, because there's an infection, that it can't be cured? And I'd submit, when there's an expert who refuses and, in fact, states affirmatively, I can't tell you that and I'm a doctor, the jury cannot make that inference, that, that because there was an infection, which, as counsel suggested, is worth $5,000, uh, that, that this could never be cured, and for the next nine months the, or seven months. You're talking months. about whether the infection could be cured, because, because the claim was, as a consequence of the failure in treatment, which I guess, which led to an infection, <clears throat> this woman had pain for the rest of her life. <clears throat> so 
the pain, in other words, the infection is the cause of the pain. Is that what Let, I, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. This was, not a, this was not something that the plaintiffs went forward and said infection, infection, infection. This was a case about failure to be able to heal. That was always their theory of the case. That's what the experts said. The, the infection was, was the agent that they discussed, but this was a failure to heal case. And, and the evidence, the, the nurse Black, the plaintiff's expert, said uh, these wounds can be healed in three to four months. Uh, but there was no testimony or evidence about what the infection did in, in the Dominican Republic. The, the evidence was that she lived with a bed sore for the rest of her life, which couldn't be healed. That was absolutely the plaintiff's theory. And, and to say that it was just a, an aggravation because there's an infection is, is wrong and you could look at any of the testimony and evidence in this case. This was a failure to heal case. Well, uh, she, she went to the hospital a bunch of times for a number of things. Hematuria, you know, she had blood in her urine, she has GI bleed, she had, and they, they cured those problems. They were bad problems on a temporary basis, but they resolved them. Absolutely. We, we don't know what was, whether the infection was resolved or not resolved, do we? We don't really know what happened in the Dominican Republic other than testimony that she still had a bed well, How about subsequent hospitals? She was at Aventura Hospital for a long time, and then she had home health care. She, she was in the States until she was discharged from this hospital on June the 28th, and she was in hospitals and other care until July, I'm going to say, Thirtieth, I'm sometime in July. She went to the Dominican Republic in I, July, I think. I believe it was July. There's places where it says June, but I think if you look at the records, it had to be July. I think twentieth. Yeah, she was in a hospital in July here, so yeah. She, that's <laughs> why I think that's that was that was the correct the correct one. Um, and again, it, it, it's as you say that the witnesses say. Uh, that there's an infection. Your Honor correctly points out infections go away. The theory was that this two-week uh, span of negligence forever caused this wound not to be able to heal. That was what the plaintiffs were seeking at trial, and that's what the plaintiffs failed to put on evidence of at trial. That's the defendant's position, that, that there was no testimony saying that without proper care, uh, within a reasonable degree of medical probability, this infection, this wound, could never have been healed. And Thank I you. see your honors are uh, packed, up and, ready packed to go. up and ready to go. We appreciate the extra time and, and your honors' and preparations. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. We are adjourned. Have a great day, both.